It was his ass that gave him away. I would recognize Casey's ass anywhere. Even if it weren't for the dragonfly tattoo high on my left cheek, I would have understood it. The woman in the video straightened up a little, and I saw a rose on her right shoulder blade. There was no doubt. It wouldn't be so bad if it was a secret beach video or something, but it was a secret society video, and she was pleasuring some guy, completely naked, with her bare ass exposed to the camera. As far as I could see, the only thing she was wearing was a damn wedding ring. Ironic. The reasoning part of my brain highlighted important facts about the video. This coincided exactly with the time when I signed a contract with an oil company to work on remote stations for a period of 18 months. Good money, great money actually, it pretty much saved us financially after the company I worked for closed down and left me unemployed. With two small children and a house on the verge of foreclosure, we had real problems. Casey's salary as an LPN was not nearly enough for us to survive, and we were desperate. I searched for months, working behind the counter at a damn video store, just to have something to do when that offer came along. The magic key was an almost forgotten paper I wrote in college on analyzing oil rig safety systems. It was a terrible 18 months in places I never wanted to go, but it prepared us for life and it got me a full-time job even though we had to move halfway across the country to take it almost as soon as I got back. I was worried about us, while I was working at these remote stations, as anyone would have. When I returned, Casey was so desperately obsessive that I locked away all these nightmares and ignored them. However, apparently, although it was unpleasant for me, it seems that Casey had a completely different experience. The camera moved. There must have been at least 14 people in the video, which appears to have been filmed in what appears to be a large, empty office with mattresses and sofas in a huge circle where cubicles would normally be located. For the most part, they had sex like rabbits. It was clearly a sex party with men and women switching partners at a pretty good pace. Despite her looseness, Casey wasn't very keen on giving me pleasure during the first few years of our marriage. I paused the video in stunned shock. The link to the site appeared in an old email account we maintained for bills and other non-work related things. Initially, the email account was hers alone, but we both ended up using it for the past few years. The email was sent to our account by the school system's automated information system. Casey worked in this system as a substitute school nurse, so I had no reason to doubt that this was, as they say, an educational video. This was definitely the case. The detached part of me noticed that someone who was very tech-savvy or worked in the school system must have really cared about Casey. I watched the video to the end and then noticed that there were at least 40 more secret society videos. Emotionally, I shut down. I heard nothing but white noise in my ears and I wanted to scream, cry and break something all at the same time. Lying, cheating bitch. I caught my breath and mechanical calm finally took over. When you design security systems for hazardous environments, you learn to be responsive rather than reactive. I looked at my watch. There was about an hour left before her gym class ended, if she was even in that class at all. I started loading videos onto the drive. Once they were all copied, I closed the link, erased that part of the history, and deleted the copies from my home computer twice. I reminded myself to stay calm. I needed to analyze it and make sure it was her. Anyone with the ability to connect to the school's computer system could have faked the video, but with so many hours of video on the site, there was a good chance they would make a mistake. It took a lot of self-control, but I managed not to lose it when Casey returned home. Nothing about it made sense. She never really lost her affection during our separation and spent every second she could with me. When she had days off, she would bring me lunch to work. If anything, she seemed a little obsessed with me, knowing where she was and being able to contact her. I told her I was doing a work project while I was breaking down the video. This bought me some time. They were absolutely real. I looked through volumes of computer forensics and frame-by-frame -frame analysis. There was no video mask. It was the real thing. She wasn't in all of them. It was a little more than half. At least 24 separate sex scenes at different times and in different places. That night, I turned on parental controls on her phone and forced it to log her calls and messages. 
The app I downloaded streamed all her phone calls as audio files to my laptop. There were people I recognized, many of them. Brady, who used to live next door to his wife Michelle Andy, the cop who lived two doors down, and his apparently not as shy as I thought wife Cindy, Chris, the guy from next door who I'm always with I didn't like because it was too smooth and too ladies' man. There was Janet Rodriguez, who, like Casey, never had a husband here. Ben, a neighborhood doctor's assistant, and Tiffany, Casey's friend who worked at a veterinary clinic. There were several more, not always the same ones. Casey was obviously a very willing participant. The strange thing was that women really interested her much more. She never showed any interest in the women I ever saw, but in most of the videos that was her main activity. Video encoding narrowed the time frame. As I expected, all the videos are dated from the moment of my deployment, that is, approximately four months after my departure. None of this seemed to happen while I was home, but the sex party happened a week after one of my three 15-day vacations ended. Putting the videos in chronological order, I saw that in the earliest videos Casey was kind of shy, a little tense, like she didn't want to be there. However, she really started to enjoy herself in later videos, especially after she started working with Sherry. Her attraction to women began to appear around the fourth party. In the final video, filmed about a month before her contract ended, she again looked stressed and walked away without doing anything other than taking off her clothes. It was probably guilt, although it was too late for the sudden growth of conscience. She was probably more worried about not getting caught. A month and a half would allow her well-used body to recover and perhaps pass an STD test. In total, I identified 16 men and women in the video. Neighbors, co-workers, parents of our children's friends, several of our children's elementary school teachers. I realized that Michelle, Brady's wife, had always been the camera operator. It seemed that her special perversion was observation. I would have spent more time analyzing and perhaps postponing the inevitable collision. I never even suspected anything like this, and it was very difficult for me to reconcile it with Casey, whom I knew so well. The most important thing I needed to know was why this letter appeared in the first place. This was not an accident and did not seem like some strange joke. Whoever posted this clearly had a reason for it, and I doubted it was a reason I would like. Another letter appeared just two days later, again to the same email address. It had the same link and another email that was technically difficult to hack, from the gym she went to. I was just lucky to be the first one that day. I could see the message and the now familiar link in the viewport. Whoever it was, he pushed events towards a result. I closed the viewing window and set up my cell phone on the camera charger, which streamed audio and video to my laptop upstairs via my home Wi-Fi network. Hey Casey, did you pay for your gym membership this month? She came up. I think so, why? I don't know, it's probably an advertisement. You have some kind of message from them marked urgent. Really? It's weird. They don't usually send anything. Yes, that's what I thought. I kissed her forehead. I have a project to work on. I need to write a review. It will take about an hour. She nodded. Is spaghetti okay? It will work. I headed up the stairs. Once I was there, I turned on the cell phone camera feed. Casey walked over to the computer without haste. She clicked the link nonchalantly, but gasped in shock at the first frame of the video. She looked around in a panic and checked the hallway, then quickly watched the rest of the videos. She copied the link onto a piece of paper, then deleted the email. I watched as she checked the stairs, then, trembling, pulled out an old address book and started texting on her phone. I quickly opened my text message log. Casey, it's Casey. You said the videos from the party were destroyed. Unknown. What the... They are destroyed. I burned the tapes a long time ago. Casey, they're everywhere on the internet. After a long pause while Casey sent the link, the answer came. Unknown, damn, who had them? Casey, I don't know. If Carl found them, he will divorce me. If he don't kill me, unknown. I thought you said you had an open marriage. Casey, not really. Unknown, so you were, like, in an open marriage but you didn't tell Carl that it was open. 
How is Ben and his wife? Crap. It was terrible. Casey, I'm not going to explain it now. Unknown, it was a long time ago. Maybe you can tell him that this happened before your marriage. Casey, we got married right after school, except to explain you or Tiff or Brady, he knew many others too. In the video, I saw that Casey was trying not to cry while sending the messages. Casey, this will destroy my life. They sent me a link to email. She was right. I was not in the mood to forgive, but I wanted to know who was doing this to her. Call it curiosity, or maybe an excuse to put off the inevitable. As bad as it was, there was a high chance that whoever did this had a plan to make it worse. Just because they went against Casey doesn't mean they were my friends. It almost certainly involved blackmail. This meant they could be targeting our money. The enemy of my enemy is the enemy of my enemy. Nothing more, nothing less. Although even as angry as I was, it was hard to call Casey an enemy. Traitor, bitch, cheater, and of course, kicked out yes. But the enemy was another matter. The discussion continued for several minutes. I collected names and phone numbers as they passed them around. It was pretty obvious that she was talking to Michelle. I have learned a lot of new things. Brady apparently died of a heart attack. I had mixed feelings about this. I always loved this guy, but I didn't know he had my wife. After discussing them, I followed those I could. Michelle has become a highly sought after music video director. Andy and Cindy separated. He was a detective in New York. She moved to California and remarried. I wondered if she would get links soon. One of the school's teachers, a woman named Robin, went to prison. Apparently she poisoned her two husbands and collected the insurance money. Hell, I went to the first one's funeral right before we moved. Her parole will be reviewed in ten years. Janet died at a rave party. Ben had returned to medical school and was now a gynecologist in Los Angeles. His wife, a very plump woman, never appeared in the video. They were still married. Ben always came with Tiffany on his arm. After that, Casey monitored the joint email account constantly. She seemed fragile and winced every time I did something on the computer. I didn't worry about missing anything because I had my account set up to forward me a copy of everything it received. I also placed sticker cameras throughout the house. Two days later, Michelle sent Casey a message. Michelle, Cindy just called me. She's hysterical. Someone sent her a link to. Casey, at least it's not just me. Did they say something? Michelle, no. Link only. Casey, why not you? Michelle, I don't know. I'm not dating anyone, so maybe there's nothing to ask for. There is nothing to blackmail with. Casey, I can't pay anything. Carl finds out. We only have joint accounts. Michelle, I don't want to make it worse, but what if they don't want the money? Casey, what do you mean? Michelle, I don't know. Just think. Casey, about what? Michelle, what if they want revenge or something like that? Casey, who? Michelle, Janet's husband, Ben's wife, your husband. Don't know. Somebody. Casey watched me like a hawk over the next few weeks, and I tried not to give her anything to worry about. I wanted to find out who was doing it and what they wanted before complicating things with more drama. I was just checking the logs and maintaining visibility. The stress made her physically ill. She had almost constant headaches, vomited many times, and lost several pounds. I showed appropriate concern. It was all part of the game at first, but I started to get genuinely concerned when I noticed that her jeans weren't holding up without a belt. It was really weird to be so mad at her, but worry about her at the same time. Her illness, however, did make one thing easier for me. She would probably wonder why we weren't having sex if she weren't so sick. Michelle contacted her occasionally. Two more women received citations, Tiffany and Tanya Logan, our son's former music instructor. I didn't initially identify her in the video because no one ever referred to her by her last name. She was only in six videos. Besides, I didn't know her that well. The fact that it was women who received the links convinced me that it was probably one of the guys, perhaps trying to create a network for money and sex. But then men might not call Michelle, so who knows? A week of peace passed when I saw an audio file from the built-in recorder I had installed on the main telephone line. 
Casey picked up the phone. Hello? This is Sherry. Casey sighed. What do you need? Sherry had a soft, gentle voice. Michelle contacted me, telling me about your problems. I thought I could help since you and I, you know. Is it true? I did some research. I followed the link. All the videos were uploaded from Chicago in the last four months. Internet Cafe. Does your husband go to Chicago? No, he was here the whole time. Are you sure? Pretty sure. They could have used zombified computers there, but it's unlikely I would have seen traces. Their erasure cycle was too short to capture anything on their security cameras, but I changed that. Now we have to wait for them to return. Casey sat down on the kitchen chair. Thank you. She paused. I'm scared. I think it might be Chris, the guy I joined. I remember him. He always seemed like an asshole to me. Casey put her head in her hands, trying to hold on. He was. More than you can imagine. Are you okay, honey? Casey sobbed, holding back tears. Not really. If you need anything, call me, anytime. I still miss you, you know. It wouldn't work, you know that. I know, it was too much of a risk. Sometimes I think we could try. Casey cried openly. I need... I need to go. Call me anytime. I love you, girl. Crap. I could sell tickets for this and make money. Still, Casey seemed less worried about me, even though she was still sick most of the time. I actually started to feel sorry for her. My initial anger was softened by time and the difficult situation. I started sending audio files and text message logs to my cell phone while going to work. This way I could spend less time upstairs and only had to watch the video files from the cameras I had installed throughout the house. There was generally very little activity. Casey worked in schools for a few days, did household chores, and watched TV. Sometimes Michelle texted her and checked on her, sometimes Sherry. It soon became apparent that Casey had become emotionally attached to Sherry, and they broke up when I returned. Sherry tried to set up a meeting and a potential three-way relationship, but Casey was scared of the consequences if it didn't work out. There were quite strong feelings on both sides, as far as I could tell. Sherry didn't seem to have a husband or boyfriend, which may have been the reason why she wasn't touched. After about a week, things really started to clear up. Sherry called. I know who it is. I'm sending you a video file from the cafe. It really is that fat bastard Chris, just like you thought. Casey's voice was almost dead. He said it was over, that we would never speak again. You know I never loved him. The only reason I put up with him was because he brought you into our group. Casey stared at her phone for a second. Damn, that's him in the video. He's gained a lot of weight. I captured the webcam on the computer of the girl who was sitting with her back to him and inserted it into the security video so you could see what he was doing. I really need to be careful, Sherry clearly knew what she was doing. I heard Casey crying after midnight. The next day I removed all the ammo from the gun and locked it in my toolbox. I also made sure the strong painkillers were gone from the cabinets. As angry and hurt as I was, I didn't want to have a suicide on my conscience that I could have prevented. I didn't want to explain this to the kids at all. I almost decided to tell her this evening, but another audio file appeared at the end of the day. I was not busy and listened to it immediately after the call. Casey picked up the phone with a half-asleep hello. Hey Casey, it's Chris. We need to talk. I heard her shock and resignation. Why are you doing this? We agreed. Just work with me and everything will be fine. Casey's voice was wooden, almost dead. What do you want? Meet me the Saturday after next at the Riviera Hotel in Jamesville. I'll text you the room number. I can't. I don't have money that I could. I could get it without Carl finding out. Find something or Carl will find out. We'll discuss the amount on Saturday. Don't bother putting on panties. Casey almost growled. You bastard. You said it was over. Chris chuckled. I kept my end of the deal. I destroyed that evidence. 
but now it's a new deal. You play by my rules and everything will be fine. This time I'm not risking jail as an accessory after the fact. Bastard. I, I, will explain this, he will understand. Of course he will. One look at this sex video and it's over. No one can help you. Just do what I say. We'll have sex whenever I want. You get me some money or jewelry and we'll have everything will be fine. How? How? Long? As much as I want. Chris hung up. I was almost ready to throw Casey out on the street, but it sounded like she got into this situation out of blackmail in the first place. He simply extended her term. I immediately called home, making up the excuse that I needed to talk about dinner. I told Casey I wanted to go to a steakhouse. This dinner seemed to bring her out of her state of apathy a little. I just didn't want her to do anything rash. She was pale and sick, but she perked up a little. I managed to make her fall asleep with her head on my shoulder. The next day she looked a little better, so I went to work. As soon as I got there, I picked up the phone and dialed Sherry's number. She answered. Hello? Sherry, this is Carl, Casey's husband. We need to talk. About what? Look, I know about your little sex club and the blackmail that's going on. I know about Chris. We can talk about the long-term consequences later. I don't know how this is going to work out, but she's the mother of my children. I have basic responsibility to protect them from the consequences of this crap, so I have to protect her from the consequences of her own actions. I'm pretty sure you have feelings for Casey, so here's your chance to help. You're a programmer, you might have the technical skills too. Help me do something about it. I didn't tell her that I had confidence in her skills because of spying on Casey. She sounded cautious, for obvious reasons. Depends on what you need. She's in trouble. Chris is putting a lot of pressure on her for sex and money. He demanded to meet her on Saturday. Sherry sighed. Chris seems to have some kind of power over her. She wasn't the type to join the club. She paused. Usually there were married couples in the club, but single women like me could join. The rule was that if a man wanted to join, he had to have a female partner. Otherwise it would turn into a sausage party. She told everyone that you had an open marriage until you came back. You can see from the video that she's become like this, but I think you're right. She said something about a deal. It sounded like some kind of blackmail. If she was wrong, and he was blackmailing her then. Then it's okay, she should have trusted me and told me what was going on. We could have worked something out, but this is crap. God. Not very forgiving, huh? There was a strange sadness in her voice, not condemnation. Try watching hours and hours of video of your supposedly faithful wife sleeping in most of the city without you even knowing it and see how you feel. She said nothing, understanding, no doubt, that I knew she was part of this big part of town. I continued, She doesn't know that I know, and I think if I tell her, it'll be too much. I don't like the way she sounds, like she's about to. Give up. Just call her. Find something about Chris and call her about it. Try to stop her from doing something even stupider, to be precise. I could almost hear Sherry relaxing. I will talk to her. I have a question. Why the hell did you all let someone take videos of your parties? That doesn't seem very smart. Fifteen years ago, the internet wasn't what it is now. No one saw it developing like this. Everyone thought it was a good idea to have insurance records to show that everything was consensual and everyone was of age because there was a problem in one of the sex clubs in the area. The tapes should have been destroyed years ago. Obviously, that didn't happen. I trusted whoever had to do it. Everyone did. Michelle? She paused for a few seconds, so I continued. I've watched about 30 hours of video, so I know quite a lot. So you'll end things with her? Probably. Almost certainly. But I'll deal with it after I resolve this issue with the bastard. We? Are you saying you love her? I love it. Then we will decide it. She sighed. I'm flying. Tomorrow. Meet me at the Sunrise Inn in Iverson. What time do you get off work? 
at half past four. Meet me at five and don't do anything stupid. You too. Sherry Casey's call was well planned and thought out. She told Casey that she had received some information about Chris and that she might be able to put pressure on him. Sherry advised her to stay home and let her try to change Chris's mind. Casey seemed much calmer when I got home and we had a fairly quiet evening. She even smiled, albeit slightly, while we were at dinner. The next day after work, I went straight to the room Sherry sent me. A thin, attractive black woman opened the door, stepped back, and looked at me critically. Enter. I walked in slowly and raised my hands so she could see that I was unarmed. She wasn't. The small machine gun was pointed at me in her right hand. I carefully lifted my shirt and turned around so she could see I didn't have a weapon. I walked over to the chair by the bed and sat down. A high-tech laptop sat on the table with several code windows running simultaneously. I leaned back. So. So. Simply put, I don't know what's next for Casey and I, probably nothing, but we'll figure it out later. This issue with Chris, however, needs to be resolved for good. Even if it can't be used to blackmail her with me, he can spread the video to all her friends, family, and children. Also, there are other people involved in this, some of them probably don't deserve the consequences of this. She looked at me thoughtfully. You kick her out, I'll take her in. I shrugged. We'll figure it out. I'm not sure how I feel about her. I keep telling myself that it doesn't matter how it started, but I think it might be important. I really don't want her to kill herself. It'll seriously mess up the kids. Life. I don't want her to make more mistakes with Chris, especially if those mistakes involve getting money for him. Do you have a plan? Kind of, but we have to trust each other or it won't work. She looked at me for a second, then put the gun on safety and placed it on the table. I relaxed. What I'm planning involves several felonies, almost to the point of murder. And that's only true if he survives, which is not guaranteed. I'm in. She's my girlfriend. She didn't hesitate, didn't blink. Amazing devotion. Maybe we should give him what? He wants to. I thought you were trying to avoid this. You know he wants sex and money. Have you ever heard the phrase, be careful what you wish for? She raised an eyebrow, and I saw a hint of a smile. I explained the plan and Sherry's role in it. She smiled. Cruel. You have a cruel sense of humor. I like it. I can deal with the computer part. I want to be involved in other aspects too, and I want to be the first. I worked in England for four years. I can do a good working-class London accent. I nodded. Fine. We will need help, but they must either participate or not participate at all. I'll let you know if and when Casey brings it up. I don't want her to get caught up in everything if something happens. Something will go wrong. To me, I don't need my kids to be covered in this crap. Together we formed and significantly expanded the plan. We talked for a good hour, and I decided that if I couldn't bring myself to make peace with Casey, she would probably be fine with Sherry. Despite everything, Sherry and I seemed to work well together, and it was impossible not to like her at least a little. I didn't really like how many more people she wanted to involve in this, but she didn't want us to have any unfinished business that could jeopardize us later. Plus, by inviting them, they themselves would know the consequences of any brilliant idea they might have for a video. We mapped out what we would need to do and set a timeline for how long we would have to do it. Before I left, she stopped me. Casey said you and her had a kind of open marriage. I didn't know about it until the very end. Until then, I thought she trusted me. Me too. One of the reasons she hasn't walked out the door yet is because this is all so unlike her. It just doesn't make any damn sense. Cherie looked down. However, I am very sorry. I just didn't know. It's Casey's business. I don't know what the hell she was thinking. Some temporary madness, but that's no excuse. Cherie kept calling Casey and urging her to relax, telling Casey that she would go to the meeting and find out what he really wanted. She also tracked Chris's movements, so when he arrived late Friday night, we were ready for him. 
She traced his call about the pizza, so I caught the pizza guy in the parking lot and paid cash for it. I put on my baseball cap and walked to his door, carefully checking for witnesses. He was probably 100 pounds heavier than he had been 15 years earlier, bloated and gangly in appearance. No wonder he thought blackmailing someone for sex might be a good idea. I picked up the bag of pizza. It will be 1995. He started rummaging through his wallet. As soon as he looked down, I stabbed the flashlight under his ear and pressed the button, holding it down and sparking as he collapsed to the ground with a strange series of creaking groans. I quickly grabbed him by the hair and pulled him inside as Sherry slipped behind me. Damn, he was heavy. Cherie handed me a needleless syringe, and I injected horse tranquilizer down his throat. We sat and waited for this to happen. Cherie called the others and quietly let them in. Together we hauled him to the parking lot in a laundry cart and loaded him up for the long ride. We needed a place with more privacy. When we were there, I kept an eye on this idiot while they got everything ready. When he arrived on Saturday morning, Sherry was sitting in front of him. He looked around with concern, realizing that he was now in an abandoned industrial building. Although he didn't know it, we were in the vehicle storage building of an abandoned gravel pit. Cherie leaned forward. Hey, Chris, it's been a while. You shouldn't have messed with my girlfriend. You know how I feel about her. Chris could not speak due to the gag in his mouth. He was bought for cash in a sex shop 100 miles away. He was also stripped and tied into a complex bondage system that could be adapted to any number of vulnerable and humiliating positions. To further humiliate him, we dressed him up in a sexy schoolgirl outfit, put a bunch of sticky blue eyeshadow on him, a bright red pigtail wig, neon pink lipstick, and stuck a bunch of pink plastic hair clips in him. Cherie even painted his fingernails and toenails. Cherie walked up behind him. I walked in front of him. Hi, Chris. I never liked you, but know that at least I know why. He really started to struggle. I shrugged. It's all water under the bridge, or it would be if you were smart enough to leave it alone. I probably would never have known. To be honest, I had my suspicions that something was going on, but not enough to make me want to look into it. If I found out, I might divorce her, I might not, but I almost certainly wouldn't think about you. But now, you had to go and poke a hornet's nest with a stick. Now you have my complete and undivided attention. I unfastened the gag for a minute and left it hanging while I stuffed a piece of turkey into his mouth and injected a mixture of tequila and stimulant down his throat. Once I was sure he had swallowed all the mixture, I put the gag back in and arranged the bondage chair so that he was essentially standing as if bent over the chair. Cherie unzipped her gym bag and began to undress. I looked at her. Chris couldn't see what was behind him, and I could tell he was going crazy, as you'd expect. If he could see what I saw behind him along the wall, he would be even more frightened. Cherie stripped completely, then caught my eye with a sly smile and winked. She then slowly dressed in a sexy version of the black Catwoman outfit, complete with a mask and thigh-high boots. When she handed me a high-end video camera, he saw her hand in a black glove, which made him struggle very hard for a minute. I checked the camera and stood slightly to the side of him and in front. Cherie looked at me and Michelle, who had a similar camera. I nodded. Whenever you're ready, I started recording. She walked around him with exaggerated importance. Uo, look, let our bitch out today. Her accent was almost perfect, at least as far as I could tell. You paid a lot of money for this, so let me start off right. She walked right up to him, put her left heel on his shoulder, and began to urinate on him. I zoomed in to catch the details. She looked away and stood silently for a second, then tore off her mask and looked at me with eyes filled with tears. I just hate that he did that to Casey. I caught her hand before she lowered the crop again and then put my arm around her shoulder. Relax, stick to the plan. This will make him even more unhappy for a long time. She snuggled close to me for a minute and then put the mask back on. I can do it. She continued to mock him. We dressed him up in his Sailor Moon costume, 
complete with a blonde wig with blue hair bows, and then put him back in place. We laid out a green outdoor rug, installed a sky-blue backdrop, and added little flowers. Cherie quietly stepped back as another figure separated from the wall. A very short woman, not fat, but a little stocky, came up wearing some kind of teddy bear costume and carrying a small wicker picnic basket. The outfit consisted of fur boots and gloves, a sort of open-cup fur corset, a pink bow tie, and a smiling teddy bear headdress. Tiffany adjusted her bow ties, then walked up to Chris's front, lifted her mask for a moment to show him her face, then lowered it and signaled for us to start recording. A high-pitched, squeaky voice began, Hey, little bitch. Welcome to the teddy bear picnic. The next half hour was one of the most surreal events I have ever seen. In contrast to Cherie's barely contained rage and aggressive humiliation, Tiffany maintained a sickeningly sweet chatter, sang cutesy but perverted songs, told sweet but erotic stories, and sang a whole series of absolutely obscene nursery rhymes. All this time she continued to insult him. When the video was finished, Red Catwoman took off her mask and looked at me with eyes full of tears. Casey clearly didn't know what to say. Sherry finally told her everything the day before Chris arrived. She claimed that Casey needed this to make sure that Chris would no longer have power over her after this. I had no idea what to say to her, and the whole process left me kind of in a daze, so I just turned to Sherry and said we needed to clean everything up. We rinsed Chris off and sat him down in a chair. We burned all the outfits and toys in a metal 55-gallon barrel that I bought specifically for this purpose. They all spoke quietly to Casey and Sherry in the corner before leaving. Before Tiffany, Cindy, and Tanya left, I noticed several concerned looks in my direction. Michelle took the camera footage and spent several hours editing and enhancing the video, cutting, mixing, and adding sound effects and music. She added pre-recorded subway announcements and the sounds of periodic subway rumblings to the restroom video. She seemed to have fun adding cartoon sound effects and silly music to the weird Bear Cubs picnic video. While she did this, Sherry worked on her laptop, adding the finishing touches to the plan. Casey and I used outdoor sprayers with water and bleach to thoroughly clean the area. She still couldn't say anything. I periodically checked to see if Chris was alive. He was alive, and although I didn't care if he died, I knew that adding murder to the list of crimes we had committed was probably a bad idea. If everything goes even slightly according to plan, he will have no evidence of what happened, all his incriminating evidence will be destroyed, and we will solve the problem forever. When evening came, he woke up. I gave him some Gatorade, this time in a bottle with a straw. He didn't say anything. I was sure he thought I was going to kill him. Welcome back, Chris. He stared at me, eyes wide and still semi-conscious. Where did you get the video, Chris? Don't make me ask twice. I have a car battery and cables I'd really like to try on you. He looked at the ground. When Brady died, Michelle had to go back to her hometown for his funeral for a week. I snuck into her house and copied them. I thought so. Now I'll tell you what happens next. Once we drop you off, I never want to hear from you again. If you report it to the police, you will disappear forever. If you tell anyone about this, you will disappear forever. You recognize some of the people here, but there are others who helped arrange this who were not here. If anyone investigates, they will discover that you personally ordered and paid for all the toys and entertainment that were used today. I grabbed his face. They were delivered to your apartment in Chicago. You paid for the video cameras, your computer will show that you did all this. Don't try to look for anything in your apartment. Everything is gone. If you have backups, I would recommend destroying them. Cindy's ex-husband had previously sent a message that he had removed everything from the apartment. We took down your site and used the multi-platform dry rot virus to track down and destroy copies of the videos you were using. It may not get all the videos, but it should destroy most of them. We decided that simply taking content from your viewers is not entirely fair, and we didn't want to leave you penniless, so. I turned the laptop to face Chris. His site was replaced by a much more professional site with the banner, 
Little Bitch's World of Adventure. He stared at the screen in horror. Bright cartoon signs offered to download clips, with small, low-quality videos running next to them. Little Bitch vs. Catwoman. The Adventures of a Little Bitch in the Outhouse. Little Bitch's Cubs Picnic. Catwoman and Evil Cat teach the Little Bitch a lesson. Even worse, the visitor counter was growing like the world population counter, and the main download indicator was working almost to the limit. Chris turned green and immediately threw up the Gatorade. Look on the bright side, Chris. You kind of got what you wanted. Looks like you're making good money from your site, and you've had sex with all the women you tried to blackmail. Maybe not in the way you expected, but sex is still sex, right? I bought a van that we borrowed from a repair shop that was temporarily closed due to the owner being incarcerated for domestic violence. I have already put fake branding and other license plates on the van. As we finished loading him into the van, Casey finally spoke to me. Where are we taking this piece of crap? Finally, I smiled. I thought he could continue his adventures, I think, waking up in the Tenderloin neighborhood of Memphis in an alley with no ID and no money in this one. She giggled. A little too long and a little too loud, but it was the first sign of humor she'd shown in weeks. Sherry sat in the back, banging away on another one of her ubiquitous laptops while I drove, and Casey stared out the passenger window, hugging herself. The entire trip was uncomfortable. Sherry periodically tried to start conversations, but Casey simply sank into her despondency. Once we got to Memphis, stopping only once for gas and once for gas and coffee, it took us about half an hour to find a suitable place to dump our toxic cargo. Casey asked how I chose it. Actually, Sherry analyzed areas based on homosexual sex trafficking, lack of cameras, gang activity, and high rates of STDs. That led us here. After we found a suitable abandoned alley and dumped it, Casey shuddered. I guess I should be grateful. It's not me in that nighty. There was something fragile and thoughtful in her tone. She wasn't sure she wouldn't be next in line for something like this. I decided it was best to say something before she had thoughts of a one-way trip on a cargo ship to a brothel in the Congo, which would send her into complete panic. You are the mother of our children, and even if they are already adults, when the grandchildren are born, they will need a grandmother. I'm not sure where we go from here, but this was not revenge. This was a solution to the current problem. Not that I didn't enjoy it. I saw her face light up with relief. About two hours after leaving Memphis, Casey spoke. Can we talk? All three of us. I want to tell you what happened. That's it. I don't need everything. I have enough video for that. My voice sounded a little calmer than I expected. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how it all started. Why did it start? Chris's remark about complicity after the fact suddenly came to mind. Maybe I really need to know. We'll talk at home. She shrank into herself, but nodded. When we got home and settled in, we sat in the living room, looking at each other. I nodded to Casey. Your turn. She stared at her feet and took a deep breath. Chris had evidence that I killed a man. This caught my attention and Sherry sat up straight. What? I went to Tiffany's sister's bachelorette party. I drank a little, but I watched what I was doing and didn't get drunk. I only had one pina colada. She looked down at her feet. From what I realized later, the dancers had an agreement with the bartender. They put something in our drinks to make everyone lose their minds. They did it often enough that they knew what they were doing. I think with the breaks off and the already sexual atmosphere, the dancers usually got their share. The girls at the bachelorette party never told anyone how out of control everything got, so they got away with it all the time. I looked at her. How did this lead to murder? Not murder. I looked up what it's called. It would be enhanced traffic violation with fatal outcome, but the punishment is almost the same. I tried to leave early, I felt sick, a little dizzy, and the music was too loud. I didn't know I was drugged, I thought I had the flu or something. One of the dancers followed me to the minivan and tried to get into the back of it. I was too drugged from what they put in my drinks to even. I know he was there. 
I ran over him, and then I ran over him again when I was leaving. I don't even remember how it happened or how I got home. God. Sherry looked just as terrible as I did. Chris worked as a part-time security guard at the club. He came to me a few days later with the camera footage. He said he told the police that someone broke in and stole the footage. If I didn't agree to his terms, he would allegedly find it somewhere in the club. No one would have believed that I wasn't drunk driving, stumbling around the minivan like I did. He played it off recently for hitting a homeless man in the thick fog. Would happen. If I resisted, I would have been locked up for twenty years, and you would have spent all our money trying to save me. Even if I begged you not to do it, you would still spend every penny for me. I couldn't afford it. This for you and the children. It was true, and I knew it. She continued. I made a deal. I agreed to be his partner in the sex club. That was his main demand. I refused to do anything else, saying that I had to take care of the children, and even finding babysitters for sex party nights could raise suspicions. He agreed to this. He was not happy, but agreed. He made it clear that if he even thought that I told anyone, he would hand me over to the police. I didn't understand that I was drugged with something almost a year later. What he said, and by then it was too late. He said he would let me go when you returned, and he did, until now. You don't look very distressed in a lot of the videos. Even as I said this, I couldn't help but remember her lost look in the earliest ones. At first I tried to, well, stay away from everything as much as I could. Chris said that if I didn't show more enthusiasm, I might think about it in prison. I just became immune to everything. Casey grabbed some towels and we helped Sherry clean up. She flinched every time Casey touched her, whispering, sorry, again and again. We managed to get her back into the living room and she started apologizing again before Casey interrupted her. Sherry, you helped me hold on. You didn't know what was going on, only Chris knew. You were the only person who looked at me as more than just a warm body. Your love may have saved me on those nights when everything was too much. It was hard and I was thinking about jumping off the bridge. I looked at Casey and she sighed. I'm sorry, Carl, but I needed someone. I had feelings for her, strong ones. I loved her, and I still do. She needed something to hold on to. A survivor of a shipwreck clinging to everything that could support her. She was lucky that Sherry really cared about her, enough to let her leave without a fight when I returned. I understand. Casey shook her head. I love Sherry, I really do. And I always will. But I'm yours, completely. And I always will be. You can kick me out after this, but I will never leave if I have a choice. I may have ruined everything, but I didn't know what else to do. I looked at her, hugging the half-curled Sherry. I walked over and sat down next to her. I don't know. You couldn't exactly talk to a lawyer about it, I think. I knew I had made a decision. I think you did everything you could. You did what you thought was best for me and the kids. That's all I could ever ask for. Her eyes widened and she looked at me with an almost pleading look. Really? Will you really forgive me? We'll be okay. I don't know if forgive is the right word. You were trapped. You didn't really have many options. You chose the least bad choice for all of us, even if you had to suffer for it. She pressed herself close to me. Now what? We'll take it day by day. Your skinny ass will start eating sandwiches, by the way. You're just skin and bones. I touched Sherry's shoulder. You saved her. I'll never forget that. Sherry nodded. She was still a little gray, but was beginning to recover from the shock. Casey, things are becoming clearer now. I, I'm glad we had. What we had. It's just a shame it was overshadowed by all this. Crap. Casey kissed her forehead. Me too. You will always be my girl. I will always love you. Sherry smiled faintly. Just not in that way, huh? I somehow knew this would happen. It's the same choice you made before, but I could dream it, couldn't I? Her smile became a little ironic as she looked at me. I owe you a lot, Sherry. We will always be there for you. I spoke sincerely. Without her, 
my house could become a tomb. Casey and I set Sherry up in the guest room and just held each other for a while. Over the next few days, we worked out what we could. Casey insisted that I know what happened now that it had surfaced. It wasn't hard to find the incident. A male dancer died after being hit by a driver outside a club. Sherry managed to get hold of his arrest record. Substances, repeated assault on a woman. He also had an aggravated assault charge, which was dropped after the victim was publicly identified and left the area. It was pretty obvious what he was going to do to Casey. Casey couldn't know all this. She didn't even know she had run into him. The police always look for the simplest explanation. She would almost certainly go to jail. Perhaps she would have been cleared if she had known she had been drugged and taken the test right away, but even that was not guaranteed. Sherry eventually returned home, although she promised to visit from time to time. She and Casey would remain the closest of friends, but forever ex-lovers. Sherry had a hard time coming to terms with her role in Casey's hell, even if it was unintentional. In the end, we hope she finds the princess she's been looking for. At least she started looking again. I thought about going back and finishing things off with Chris. What he did was unspeakable, inhumane, but I decided not to do it. Not because he had suffered enough, or because I just wanted to let it go. I let it go because it was probably the cruelest thing I could do to him. His experience broke something in him. Casey and I received a call from Michelle. Chris called her and meekly asked for help. Little bitch seems to have been a hit among a certain kinky demographic that paid very good money to watch his absolute humiliation on video. We conditioned it by accident. Probably because he associated the high from fentanyl with humiliation, he became increasingly obsessed with it. He quickly got to the point where he could only get satisfaction from watching and experiencing his humiliation, but he needed fresh videos for his site along with new humiliations for himself. They became more and more extreme each time. It didn't take long to realize what was happening. Pilots call this a death spiral. He thought he was flying straight, but in fact he was flying in a death spiral, losing altitude and approaching an inevitable crash. Last time I checked, he added some new videos to his site with Michelle's help. Michelle refused to make a video, but showed him how to install the cameras himself. I guess she didn't want to be there at the end. He begged Michelle to get Catwoman and Evil Cat back together for another video. This is his most popular video. Frighteningly, the video of the Cubs having a picnic comes in second place. Knowing this, I started checking the doors twice at night. Casey and Sherry are completely uninterested. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.